So um, we all know Neha Dengayich, who is the um, co-director of the Neurosciences ICU at Mount Sinai Hospital and an assistant professor in our department in the Department of Neurology. Um, she has been a, an active and uh, important member of the department for several years and has been a, a really important member of the, the teaching component of the neurocritical care group um, in terms of teaching our residents and frankly teaching uh, the remainder of our faculty more about neurocritical care. Um, she's going to be um, presenting to us today uh, the neurocritical care cases and pearls and just an additional announcement. Um, but as you know, last year, uh, Chris took over the uh, wellness uh, position as uh, the wellness position in our department and uh, quickly realizing that it is a fairly sizable uh, role and perhaps should be divided into two, one for faculty and one for residents. Um, Neha will be taking over the faculty wellness champion role and Chris will be continuing on as the uh, resident or GME wellness champion role. Um, so between the two of them, I hopefully we will all continue to be more well in our lives. Thank you so much, Peter, for that uh, kind introduction. And I'm going to go in slide, slide mode. Um, so thank you again for the invitation, and it's my honor and privilege to present at the Neurocritical Care Pearls and Cases section of the Grand Rounds. And I'm going to talk about a topic that's very close to my heart about the ICU liberation bundle and post-intensive care syndrome. Um, just a couple of uh, non-financial disclosures. Uh, we are part of the Post-ICU Recovery Clinic Thrive Collaborative of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, the Cairo Post-ICU uh, Recovery Collaborative. And I'm also faculty for the SCCM's Virus Learning Collaborative, uh, which is a collaboration with CDC and SCCM. The objectives for today's talk is to learn about the science of the ICU liberation bundle and uh, to learn more about PICS and critical care recovery programs. Um, Several of you have come through our ICU either as, uh, as the primary uh, team members taking care of these patients or requesting for, um, for uh, you know, the ICU team's input on, uh, on patients who are critically ill. And as you can imagine, a lot of these patients uh, are very sick, they're intubated, they're sedated, they can't speak to you, they can't let you know what's, what's actually happening to them. And ICUs in that respect can be very dehumanizing. And often we refer to these patients as bed numbers, which again adds to that dehumanization component. And putting an extra effort in trying to recognize a human being behind the patient is way harder in a critical care environment because these patients are so sick and there are so many numbers. It's a data rich environment. So what do we do to intentionally realize that there is a human being behind that behind that patient. So a lot of thought has gone into this process and uh, several, for several years now, almost coming up to three decades worth of data to help us understand how to humanize the ICU. So thus was born the ABCDE bundle. And I won't go into every single study that has led to the different components of this bundle, but this bundle came to be known as the ICU liberation bundle. And, um, uh, in the next few slides, I'll go over each of these different components, but the purpose of showing you some of the earlier studies is to, is to highlight the fact that these were studies published in very high impact journals. Some of them are cohort studies, some of them are randomized controlled clinical trials, but that's how our understanding of some of the components that can help us humanize the ICU were born. So first in, the, in 2013, the Society of Critical Care Medicine put together this A to E bundle, and what, what does A to E stand for? So the ABCs are uh, awakening patients. So the spontaneous awakening and the spontaneous breathing. And then once you awaken a patient, you help them breathe on their own with minimal support from mechanical ventilation. So that's essentially our SAT and SBT. So what does this do? Each of these components, the SAT and the SPT, and the SAT plus SPT have been shown to decrease the duration of mechanical ventilation, decrease mortality, decrease the overall duration of coma. Similarly, when it comes to choosing the type of sedative that we should be using for patients who are critically ill, the choice of sedation matters. Avoiding benzodiazepines is important. And the choice of sedative, particularly guided by well-validated tools, can help decrease the duration of mechanical ventilation, also decrease mortality and delirium. When we think about delirium, um, 
for a moment, let's let's um, think only about critically ill patients and not neurocritically ill patients. These delirium scales were validated in patients who did not have acute brain injuries. And when we think about the fluctuations in level of consciousness, fluctuations in attention, uh, or the ability to, to recall, and um, these fluctuations in patients who have seemingly normal brains, when they are critically ill, either because of sepsis or ARDS, they were diagnosed as having delirium. So it's important to monitor delirium as well as measure delirium. And some of these scales in a neurocritical care population, each of these different studies, each of these different components that I'm, that I'm mentioning, the quality of studies in neurocritical care for these components is, is um, definitely lower because these, these components are much harder to study in patients who have acute brain injury. However, these guideline statements from the Society of Critical Care uh, were, um, were endorsed by the Neurocritical Care Society as well. So why is it important to monitor delirium and, and measure delirium? Because delirium, it has been associated with increase in almost 50% mortality for any critically ill patients. It's also associated with, with longitudinally increasing the risk of developing uh, an earlier onset of dementia as compared to the general population. So that's why it's important to monitor for delirium and manage delirium. The, the tricky thing about delirium though, is because it's a mixed bag diagnosis, uh, treating the underlying cause uh, is important, and uh, that's perhaps the only way. So prevention is better than trying to treat or cure delirium. So prevention is important. Identifying the underlying causes and treating those is important. And um, specifically, measuring delirium with well-validated scales is, has been recommended. The early mobilization piece um, Lots of data that, that has emerged in the last decade or so on how early mobilization can really help prevent some of the consequences of critical care, decreases the duration of delirium, longitudinal, uh, uh, you know, ICU acquired weakness, uh, ICU length of stay, as well as mortality. So this bundle was then extended to include a very important component, the presence of family members at the bedside. Um, Chris often says that more than anything else that he can do as a surgeon, the presence of a family member at the bedside can do much more for his critically ill patients. And I think that really encompasses the power of having families at the bedside. And this, this uh, led to the extension of the bundle from ABCDE to ABCDEF, where F stands for families. To just give you an idea of how rigorous these guideline statements were, for each of the components, there were PICO questions and descriptive questions that, that were outlined and experts from, um, from uh, different aspects of critical care were part of this guideline statement. And these studies were, were rig rigorously evaluated before putting forth some of these recommendations. And this is perhaps one of the slides that I want you uh, to take as a take home message for, uh, for how can you apply this to your practice? And what are, we, what are we doing in the ICU when we are choosing specific types of sedatives? Why are we choosing fentanyl instead of, uh, why are we using analgo sedation? So both treating pain as well as trying to sedate our patient with one agent rather than using a combination, for example, of propofol and fentanyl. Why are we not using Versed more commonly in an ICU setting? Um, why are we using Presidex for certain patients? So there's a lot of thought that goes into the choice of a sedative. There's a lot of thought that goes into the titration of a sedative as well as an analgesic drip. And without belaboring the point, what I want you to take from this slide is essentially the bundle what, what do each of these components stand for? So A stands for assessing and treating pain. A also stands for this spontaneous awakening trial. B stands for breathing, so the spontaneous breathing trial. C specifically stands for coordinating care, so this multidisciplinary coordination of care. C is also for choice of sedative, so choosing the right sedative and trying to use lighter sedation or analgo sedation, choosing both pain something that will treat both pain as well as sedate your patient if you really have to sedate your patient. And delirium, uh, really targeting the underlying causes of delirium because there's really no proven cure or treatment for delirium. And then specifically early mobilization, exercising even in bed for those patients who cannot get out of bed. And family, communication, involvement, engagement, shared decision-making. So 
this this is one key key message that i want to share with you and to learn more about this the icu liberation uh, website and the icu delirium website the icu delirium website is maintained by the vanderbilt uh, university and icu liberation by society of critical care medicine lots of resources lots about the studies that have got, that have informed the different components of this bundle so just a few scales that we end up using at the bedside you'll often you might see this in, in EPIC uh, and might wonder how we're titrating pain. For example, how do we know that an intubated patient is in pain or a patient with acute brain injury is in pain? So the CPOT scale, which is this critical care uh, pain optimization tool was first developed in patients who did not have acute brain injury. Subsequently, it has been validated in a neurocritical care environment. And just as a representative example, so is your patient intubated, not intubated? Uh, what are they looking like on the ventilator? Can they tolerate it or not? What is their facial expression? So even if your patient is aphasic, just looking at the patient's body language, body movements, are they, are they appearing tense or not? The cutoff for this scale, two or higher, is regarded as um, as your patient being in pain, and then and then understanding, uh, and also quantifying. So, for example, in this representative example, we have a score of three. So we're saying this is an unacceptable amount of pain for your patient. So so try to titrate your medications for a CPOT of two or lesser. Some other scales that you, you will uh, see us uh, using the RAS, the Richmond uh, Agitation Sedation uh, Scale. This was developed uh, almost now, 20, almost uh, 2021 years ago, and has been well validated in various studies. Uh, again, more difficult to use in patients with acute brain injury, but this is the scale that we're using currently um, for titrating our sedative drips. And the CAM, this confusion, um, you know, the confusion assessment uh, method. Uh, this was first developed for hospitalized patients, then modified for ICU patients. The CAM ICU hasn't been fully, fully validated for neurocritical care patients, but this is the best that we have at this point. There are other ICU delirium uh, scales like the ICU delirium checklist as well that can also potentially be used for the same purpose. So has the implementation of this bundle been studied? Yes, this the implementation of this bundle and implementation of different aspects of this bundle have been studied. So this ICU liberation movement involved uh, almost 76 ICUs, including pediatric ICUs, and uh, essentially looking at what the synthesis of literature and this bundled therapy, um, or this, this bundle of trying to humanize the ICU, liberate patients from the ICU, do for your ICU environment. So this is the map of all the different ICUs that participated in uh, the ICU liberation movement. And specifically, what I, what I found fascinating was as you look at the compliance, so on the x-axis, you look at the compliance with the ABCDEF bundle, and on the y-axis, you can see hospital survival. So as the compliance with the bundle increases, even when you have 50% compliance, you're seeing almost 80% survival uh, in your critically ill patients, and uh, this included almost 6,000 patients. And as the compliance with the bundle increases, survival increases, but even partial compliance, so compliance with only some components of the bundle can also increase survival. The early mobilization movement, um, there's, there's a very nice repository of literature for those of you who are interested in learning more about where do some of these uh, ideas and protocols come from and is it safe to move a critically ill patient? Well, it's, it's not only safe, but also improves outcomes. Uh, there are also studies that have looked at specifically uh, ambulating patients with EVDs, ambulating patients on ECMO, on CVVH, on different kinds of uh, uh, mechanical support, um, including mechanical ventilation. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about different studies, uh, this website does a really nice job of collating uh, several, several studies. So their, their literature repository has more than 1,000 papers. And it includes papers on the ICU uh, liberation movement as well. Uh, the guidelines for family-centered care uh, in, the, in, in different ICU settings was released by the Society of Critical Care Medicine just a few years ago. It did also provides 25 recommendations. It also provides a gap analysis tool for different ICU settings. So for us, um, we have adopted several of these, um, several of these to our neuro ICU setting. Um, as you can imagine, COVID-19 posed a big challenge to the implementation of this bundle, as well as upholding some of these principles. 
And uh, there was an update released um, last year specifically to provide guidance in how can we uphold some of the good principles of critical care in liberating patients from the ICU um, in the COVID era. And uh, why were these patients at a higher risk of developing, uh, developing some consequences? And in the next few slides, I'll talk about some of these unintended consequences of critical care called post-intensive care syndrome. So for COVID-19 patients, everything that comes with being a critically ill patient plus the lack of family, plus the uncertainty of a global pandemic, plus being very, very sick with multiple, um, you know, multi-system uh, failure, organ failure, uh, that, that just increased the risk of delirium in these patients. Um, for those of you who, who are interested in, in uh, hearing a very powerful story of an ICU survivor. So this, this was from a plenary session uh, in 2016 at the SCCM. And this was perhaps one of, one, of the, one of those pivotal points for me when I got inspired to study more about ICU liberation and study more about post-intensive care syndrome. So Nalini Nadkarni, who's this ecobiologist, she fell from, from a, a tree in the rainforest in Brazil and she had everything, ARDS, septic shock, she was delirious. And she talks about the fear of loss of her identity, of, uh, of herself as a scientist, as somebody who, who really um, uh, identified herself with her words. And the fact that she had this fear of loss of life, of her identity, of the inability to speak and write. She talks about that and then bouncing back. So a year after her survival, she went back to the same point and uh, she describes this journey of what post-intensive care syndrome meant for her and what uh, this new normal was. It's not bad, it's just different. So that brings us to post-intensive care syndrome. And what is post-intensive care syndrome? Essentially the worsening or development of new impairments in these different domains, in the physical domain, cognitive, mental health, or psychiatric domain. And these are this is not what we intended for our patients, but it just happens as part of taking care of critically ill patients. Um, this, uh, this particular uh, core outcome uh, measures or core outcome data set is being developed by several researchers out of um, Hopkins, Dale Needham and his group got funded to, to study this. So what is meaningful to patients and families? In addition to those domains, what else matters once they survive um, respiratory failure? So for PICS, specifically any impairment uh, in one of these domains in the physical cognitive psychiatric domain, let me give you a pause here because all of the studies right up to this point for post-intensive care syndrome excluded patients with acute brain injuries, excluded patients with pre-existing uh, uh, dementias or neurodegenerative disorders. So what I'm describing now is what happens to patients who come in with normal brains. So then what happens to our patients who are who are acutely ill with, uh, who have various kinds of acute brain injuries, that's something that our group is currently studying. So why is PICS even important? There are millions of ICU survivors and about 80, of, 80 to 85% of patients who are critically ill are going to survive. And more than 50% of these are going to suffer from PICS. We think about our older patients, we have about 1.4 million, and this is all pre-COVID data, uh, and several of these, so more than half of our uh, older patients are also going to suffer from PICS in addition to this, um, this state of ICU survivorship. So let's talk a little bit about the physical domain. In the physical domain, the ICU acquired weakness, critical illness myopathy, critical illness neuropathy, critical illness myopathy, and polyneuropathy. So what are some risk factors for why patients can develop this? Um, uh, sepsis, this catabolic state, uh, longer duration of mechanical ventilation, not moving, just being bed bound. Every uh, single day that a patient stays in bed, not moving, moving from, from their bed, they lose about three days of mobility. I think that early, I cannot emphasize enough why early mobilization is important, is so important. So several of these risk factors lead to this critical illness, uh, myopathy, polyneuropathy. And the other things at a pathophysiological basis, so there's microvascular injury, there's this a profound catabolic state, the immobility sort of adds insult to injury, there's ischemia and mitochondrial dysfunction. With respect to the cognitive domain, um, uh, just a quick uh, point about this landmark study, the brain ICU study. Incidentally, this study also excluded patients with acute brain injuries and pre-existing dementia, but uh, had more than 800 patients. And what they found in patients with sepsis and ARDS 
that uh, at three months and 12 months, even in younger patients, their uh, R bands global cognitive score was closer to what TBI patients would have had. And then for older patients, their scores were closer to, to what uh, patients with um, Alzheimer's disease would have. Uh, even in structural um, studies, trying to identify the structural basis. So for patients with normal brains, then they, they develop um, sepsis and delirium. Uh, they've been found to have global atrophy. In uh, systematic reviews that have looked at several studies uh, for the mental health domain, it's been found that anxiety and depression can coexist in about a third to almost 40% of ICU survivors. There are several pre-ICU, ICU-related factors, as well as post-ICU-related factors. This table just specifically talks about the number of studies that have uh, looked at these, these different factors. Some of them are very self-explanatory, uh, low employment status, low education educational status, income, socioeconomic status. So those patients are more vulnerable to the consequences of critical care. Similarly, for depression, about a third of our patients are going to suffer from depression after surviving uh, their ICU stay. And this depression can persist for a long period of time, including 12 months. Uh, when we look at the different phases of care for critical illness, there's of course the acute illness, there's hospital recovery, the immediate uh, post-discharge phase and the late post-discharge recovery. Each of these phases provides very important um, uh, targets for intervention and for preparing our patients for success. When we think about PICS, it really does take a village and PICS can be prevented. And there are several measures in the ICU, uh, engaging family members, as well as for, for post-ICU that can help us both improve awareness about PICS as well as prevent PICS. Um, what do post-ICU recovery programs look like? So when we, when we think about all these different phases, without going into all these different areas of opportunity, multidisciplinary team members can contribute to identifying key areas of intervention to help our uh, critically ill patients survive. As an example, just medication reconciliation. When you admit a patient to the hospital or to the ICU, reconciling their medications, starting the medications that they should not miss and medications that you're going to hold get restarted uh, unless you're going to discontinue them. Certain medications like Seroquel or uh, AD prophylaxis like Keppra, it's prophylaxis, it should be stopped after seven days. Seroquel, several, of, several critically ill patients get discharged on Seroquel when they don't really need to be on it. It was probably started just for symptomatic relief from agitated delirium. So there are several collaboratives that are looking to improve the care of critically ill, Ill patients. Uh, there's uh, one such collaborative is a Cairo collaborative that we're also a part of, and it has both post-ICU recovery clinics as well as peer-to-peer uh, -peer support groups. This is what our group looks like. This photograph, of course, is pre-COVID. We cannot we cannot assemble in a group without masks now, uh, but we're doing several projects, including a critical care recovery clinic, ICU diaries. When you walk through the neuro ICU at Mount Sinai Hospital, you're going to see these signs that talk about uh, enrollment in an ICU diary project. Stop by, write a little message for your patient, uh, particularly if your patient is in a coma, cannot speak, or your patient um, is uh, critically ill. These, uh, these ICU diaries have really been shown to prevent PTSD among patients and uh, family members. When you look at uh, this multidisciplinary component of a critical care recovery program, uh, and these are some components that we have as well now. We've got a critical care recovery clinic. We've just started our peer-to-peer -peer support group for family members of the of uh, neuro ICU survivors. But there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Specifically, do clinics help? And um, that's that's something uh, intuitively clinics. Uh, are supposed to help in care coordination and what the, what what's been found both for clinics as well as for um, for ICU diaries, the mental health domain, the medication reconciliation domain, uh, that's that's really helped by uh, post post ICU recovery clinics. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over some of these slides and. Uh, we saw our first patient in our critical care recovery clinic uh, in February, right before COVID. Then we pivoted very quickly to a telehealth model. And uh, this is just some preliminary data from our clinic. We've seen about, uh, when I prepared these slides, we'd seen about 76 patients. Now we've seen about 95 patients. It's a good mix of, of uh, COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 patients. We're seeing patients from multiple ICUs, including the neuro ICU. And um, specifically, 
for the multi-domain outcome measures, we're using REDCap for capturing some of these outcomes. One of our papers was just published uh, looking at the outcome measures for COVID-19 survivors and uh, more than we would have anticipated, about 90% of these survivors had PICS. So I'll wrap up with, uh, with a patient story that I think several of you on the call may be familiar with. So uh, Megan Onifri and uh, Nick Nelson's story. Uh, so Megan came to us uh, in December as a 40 year old, uh, very healthy. She was just running in the park and she collapsed, a passerby called 911. And she was taken to, uh, to uh, Mount Sinai Morningside. And uh, in under 100 minutes, she was transferred over after being uh, after recognizing that she was having a basilar stroke. She underwent thrombectomy, had a prolonged hospital course. Uh, she had to undergo a suboccipital trainee. She had EBD, ICP crisis, sepsis, seizures. Uh, you name it, and she developed that complication. DVTs, PEs, she needed a VP shunt, so on and so forth. And we were very grateful to see Megan back in our clinic. And now she's been reintegrated back into, into the community. She rated her frailty at uh, three months post-discharge from rehab as being severely frail. And on this, on this visual scale, you can see what severely frail looks like. And specifically, when we asked her to rate her resilience, her ability to bounce back from any stresses in life, she rated this as 47. Uh, to, give you, uh, to give you some context, the average American's resilience on this scale is about 34. So Megan rated herself as highly resilient, but also severely frail. Um, this is, this is Megan, Nick, and their children. And this is one of the reasons why we do what we do. And I think the ICU liberation movement and what this means for patients with acute brain injuries, do these patients have a higher risk of developing PICS as compared to patients without acute brain injuries? That's what we're currently studying. And for Megan, there were these two big takeaways. And she essentially said it could happen to anybody, uh, even somebody as healthy as her. And uh, the recovery from stroke is a long one. It takes a while. I'm pushing myself very hard and still it's taking a long time. So with that, I'd like to stop and uh, say thank you for the opportunity. Lots of acknowledgements and uh, various collaborators. Our website is live for the critical care recovery program. So do check it out. Thank you. Thank you, Neha. <clears throat> Amazing presentation. Very thank concise. <clears throat> and you covered a lot of ground. I'm sure people realize that Neha has focused on the entry with, ne with NEMAT and the exit. Um, obviously, what happens during the, the stay is very important, but these fringes uh, influence the outcome far more than we realized before. I think this is one of the themes that she is bringing to Mount Sana and to the world. Are there any questions that people would like to discuss with her or ask? Yeah, Neha, that's really awesome. And um, I've referred a few patients to you and uh, they've been dramatically helped by your assistance and, and your care. And so um, are you automatically enrolling patients in the clinic or are you looking for referrals um, from people taking care of patients who were previously in the ICU? Thank you, Dr. Bereson, and, uh, and and Chris specifically. Uh, thank you for the referrals as well. So as we're actively beginning to ramp the program up and screening patients, so who's at a higher risk of developing post-intensive care syndrome? Anyone who stayed in the ICU for 48 hours or longer, so two days or longer, uh, would be eligible for referral to our clinic. I showed you various risk factors. So what we don't understand at this time for patients with acute brain injuries, with different kinds of brain injuries as they're recovering from complex neurosurgical procedures as well, who is going to remain at risk? And some of those things that are quantified as post-intensive care syndrome, well, they're also going to have those consequences as a consequence of their acute brain injury or their brain tumor, uh, depression, PTSD, anxiety, uh, cognitive impairment. So screening patients the ability of our clinic to screen patients for those kinds of impairments, whether they are from PICS or from their underlying acute brain injury, I think that's one key, key component that we bring to Mount Sinai. Uh, so active referrals from you, uh, particularly for our other um, hospitals. Uh, for Mount Sinai Hospital, we are actively screening patients who get admitted to the neuro ICU, we'll, we'll include them in a database. But for our other system hospitals, we haven't expanded our services yet, but uh, Chris has referred patients to us 
from Mount Sinai West. So uh, what I would ask our team to do, if you think somebody could benefit from a multi, uh, multidisciplinary um, uh, clinic, uh, which includes spiritual care, intensive care, pharmacy, uh, social work, case management, uh, please send send them. Um, please shoot me an email or call me up. Send me a text. Uh, we'll we'll make sure to see them. Great, thank you. We have a comment in the chat from uh, Dr. Anurada Singh. Uh, Thanks for bringing up such important issues with the group. Patients who go into status epilepticus get started on several anti seizure drugs, which need to be titrated down during their recovery road. Happy to collaborate in those clinics. Absolutely. And one of the key things that even our colleagues in uh, in the rest of the critical care world have realized, patients get started on a bunch of medications. They never get stopped, uh, particularly medications like Seroquel, uh, medications like haloperidol. Like these get started, never get stopped. Nobody sees them and their care gets fragmented and they get lost to follow up. So we can definitely do better. Status epilepticus is a great example of how quickly we ramp up people's medications, but don't end up de-escalating those medications as these patients keep getting better. Neurostimulants, anti-epileptics, as we're beginning to see uh, neurocritical care patients in our clinic, we're realizing ADs and neurostimulants are uh, two classes of medications that our patients probably don't need to be on as they're getting better. So we need to, we need to uh, de-escalate as well. Thank you.